Good luck getting that one out of your head this afternoon. The portion of God's word that we're going to focus on on this Transfiguration Sunday comes from 2 Peter chapter 1. Let's begin with prayer. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In the 1980s, a psychologist and memory expert named Elizabeth Loftus conducted an experiment. She compiled two separate jury groups who were going to participate in a mock trial about a hypothetical robbery and murder case. So when the first jury group came to the mock trial, to the courtroom, they were given a a basic description of the case, and then the prosecutor gave the evidence, which is entirely made up of just circumstantial evidence. And at the end of the mock trial, 18% of the jury found the imaginary defendant guilty of the hypothetical crime. That was the first jury. The second jury group came in, and they heard the exact same description of the case, They heard the exact same prosecutor give the exact same circumstantial evidence that the first jury group had heard. Only with the second jury group, they added one additional element. One eyewitness who gave testimony during the trial. This time, 72% of the jury found the imaginary defendant guilty of the hypothetical crime. A 54% swing simply by adding eyewitness testimony. And Elizabeth Loftus, she, she, practiced, she put into practice this experiment to prove her hypothesis of the major impact that eyewitness testimony has on people's perception of the truth. And it makes sense, right? If you hear somebody who was at an event sharing what they saw and heard with their own eyes and ears, we perceive it with a general sense of, of reliability and trustworthiness. Because they were there in the scene, and, and we maybe weren't, we tend to take them at their word. And so today we hear eyewitness testimony from the Apostle Peter. Eyewitness testimony of what he saw and heard at the transfiguration of our Lord. And because of this transfiguration eyewitness account that St. Peter gives to us, you and I are able to have transfiguration certainty. Not just transfiguration certainty about the transfiguration, but transfiguration certainty because of the transfiguration. See, Peter first starts out and takes us to this place, the mountain of transfiguration, and and he includes this in his second letter to the Christians in Asia Minor as a way of encouraging them and, and, and leading them to stand firm in their faith because they were being attacked by false teachers. And so to assure them to stand strong in their faith in Jesus, Peter says this, We did not follow cleverly devised stories when he told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And then he takes his audience to that place on that day on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus took Peter and the brothers James and John up onto that mountaintop and showed them something incredible. We're told he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. That word transfigured means to have your appearance changed. And that's certainly what happens to Jesus at the transfiguration. He goes from being a ho-hum, humble human Jesus to being this glorious, radiant Jesus. Jesus, who is shining with this blinding light that's literally emanating with the glory of God. And so in this momentary glimpse of the divine glory of Jesus, God was giving to Peter, James, and John an unforgettable reminder of who Jesus really is, the Holy Son of God. From there, Peter continues. Jesus received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. And so as Peter, James, and John stand blinking into the blinding light of the glory of God, suddenly they're enclosed, encapsulated by this glorious shining cloud, just like the one we heard about on Mount Sinai when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. And from within that cloud that surrounded them, 
Peter, James, and John heard the voice of God the Father reiterating who Jesus is, his dearly beloved Son, encouraging the apostles and us to listen to him. And so you have eyewitness testimony and ear witness testimony that all point to the same thing, that Jesus is the Son of God. And so Peter shares this eyewitness testimony with us, with his audience, to verify that the message that he and the other apostles had been preaching and teaching about Jesus were not fable or myth or fan fiction. The transfiguration is irrefutable evidence that Jesus really is the Savior of the world. And we see that at the transfiguration because at transfiguration we see it all come together. When we see Jesus literally shining with the glory of God, when we hear the Father's voice booming his approval and reiterating Jesus' identity, who could doubt that Jesus really is the Son of God? And yet because this is a a temporary, a glimpse, a, a momentary shining forth of glory, because Jesus eventually sets aside again that glory to take on his humble humanity, we see that this is a temporary glory. Jesus sets it aside so that he can once again go back down that mountain, down into the valley, so he can carry out the humble plans that God had for him. As he told his disciples just six days before this happened, he needed to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. And so who could deny that Jesus really is the Son of Man, a humble, inglorious human being who is able to suffer and die? And so Peter's eyewitness testimony of the transfiguration gives us absolute certainty that who Jesus says he is and who the apostles teach us he is, is true. The transfiguration shows us that Jesus really is the Son of God and the Son of Man, the Savior of the world who has paid for all of our sins and promises eternal life to all who believe in him. And we have eyewitness testimony to back it up. But how reliable it really is eyewitness testimony. Elizabeth Loftus, the same psychologist who did the experiment to show the major impact that eyewitness testimony has on people's perception of the truth, she also did some other research that showed that about 50% at the time, 50% of the wrongful convictions that took place in America stemmed from mistakes made from eyewitness testimony, calling into question whether eyewitness testimony in a courtroom was really all that impactful at all. And she found that there were certain criteria and there were certain circumstances that made eyewitness testimony absolutely unreliable. And so there's plenty of skeptics that would say the same thing about Peter and the apostles and all of these accounts of Jesus. They would say that all these stories about Jesus' life and his ministry and his miracles and the gospel are nothing more than, than fairy tales fantasies, fables, and myths that, that Jesus' followers concocted to try, and de- de- try and deceive people into thinking Jesus is the Son of God when really he's nothing more than a, a humble human being like us. So can we trust that Peter, in his eyewitness testimony, is really telling us the truth? If all we have to rely on is some human beings like Peter claiming that they were eyewitnesses of Jesus' glory, then We can't really be certain, can we? Maybe he was making it up. Maybe he was lying, just like people would claim. And so Peter goes above and beyond. Not only does he point to his eyewitness testimony, he then follows it up by pointing to the complete reliability of Scripture. He says, We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. You must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And we call this verbal inspiration. It's the teaching that all of the words of the Bible are inspired by God. And we hear inspiration here. Don't think like I saw my profile in the mirror and it inspired me to get back to the gym. That's motivation that causes someone to act. When the Bible talks about inspiration, it's from two Latin words, in and spiro, which means to breathe into. As we hear in 2 Timothy, all scripture is God-breathed, 
meaning that God the Holy Spirit literally breathes into the human authors of the Bible the very words that he wanted them to write. And so although the Bible has human authors, men like Moses and Peter and John and Paul, the fact is God is really the author of the Bible. As Peter says, prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And the Greek word there for being carried along is the same word that they would use to describe what wind does to a sailboat. Now, if you want to get to the other side of the lake, the sailboat is the vessel that you're in to go across. The wind doesn't just pick you up and scoop you to the other shore. But the fact is, if out that wind blowing into the sails of the sailboat, you're never going to reach your destination. And so God uses human authors and their writing abilities as his vessel to get the word out there, but ultimately he's the one that's driving it to get to where it is. And so the word of God is truly that, the word of God. And that has immense meaning and implications for our lives. Because if the Bible is simply a collection of the thoughts and ideas of a bunch of human dudes, you can take it or leave it. Just like you, some people can say, Charles Dickens is the greatest author who ever wrote anything. And some people might say, I'll just wait for the movie to come out. If the Bible is nothing more than, than the writings of some humans, then you can look at it in the same way. But if God, the all-powerful, all-knowing creator and sustainer of the universe, if God is the one who wrote the Bible, then the Bible is the most important the most impactful, the most powerful, the greatest priority that you have in your life. It's the thing that guides and directs everything that you do or say or think in your life. You look to it and you follow it even when it goes in conflict to your personal opinions or society's whims or human logic. If God is the author of the Bible, that means that we have to bend our lives to fit it instead of vice versa. If God is the author of the Bible, then we can look with absolute certainty at eyewitness testimony from men like Peter and know that it's the truth. Because God is the one who wrote the Bible. And we have that complete certainty. Now, Elizabeth Loftus, I mentioned, she came up with a number of different criteria and circumstances that, that make eyewitness testimony unreliable. In one case, she found that if an eyewitness saw something from a distance it could make their eyewitness testimony unreliable. But Peter, James, and John didn't see the transfiguration from a distance. They were up close and personal. They were within the cloud of the presence of God to see everything that happened there. And Elizabeth Loftus found that, that eyewitness testimony can become unreliable if it's seen in, in poor lighting. But Peter and James and John weren't seeing in poor lighting. They were seeing in the most beautiful, the purest, and holiest light that there could be the glory of God. And she also found that sometimes if an eyewitness has a certain bias about something that they see, that can affect the reliability of their eyewitness testimony. But if you look at the accounts leading up to the transfiguration and the accounts after the transfiguration of how well Peter grasped who Jesus really was, it's kind of a tragic comedy this constant flow of ups and downs, of highs and lows, of beautiful confessions of faith, and then abject failure of understanding who Jesus really is, followed up even by, by complete denial of Jesus. And that makes it clear for us that Peter is not recording what he saw that fit the bias that he had about who Jesus was. Peter is recording for us what he believed because of what he saw. And so we can look to this eyewitness testimony backed by the very word of God with complete certainty. But isn't there a little skeptic in our hearts? A little skeptic that deep down really wants to believe that the Bible wasn't really written by God, it was written by a bunch of human beings. Because then, if we come across something in the Bible that we don't necessarily like, we can just chalk it up to say, oh, that doesn't apply to me. We can look at scripture and we can say, I don't need to follow that if it's just by a bunch of men. And I can filter my life entirely through the, the greater of, of what do I feel and what do I think instead of what does God say. And Satan is sure to press on that skepticism. To tell you, well, oh, sure, Peter wants you to believe that his message is legit. So of course he's going to tell you that his message came from God. But 
the Muslims claim that too and the Mormons, and so many other of the religions in the world. So who's to say that Christianity is right out of all the religions that say their message came from God? I think there's a couple of reasons that we can look to the message of the Bible with complete certainty and complete reliability. The first one is, is something that Peter himself mentions in this sermon text. Prophecy. See, the inspired writers of the Bible record around and even over about 1,500 prophecies foreshadowing and looking ahead to things that are going to happen in the future. And every single one of those prophecies made in Scripture is perfectly fulfilled. Sometimes hundreds or thousands of years after the prophecy was made. So the prophecy stems from everything, including the, the secular kings and kingdoms and their rise and falls in the world around the people of God. and involves even the most intricate and minute details of the life of the Messiah, we're not talking about obvious Nostradamus type predictions of there will be wars or natural disasters. Of course those things are going to happen. No, God in his word gives us the most intricately detailed prophecies, the most unfathomable things, and connects us to the truth. Like that the Messiah would be born of a virgin. Or that the Messiah of the universe would be born in this little backwater town called Bethlehem. And then for a while he'd move to Egypt and then after that he would grow up in another little backwater town called Nazareth. Or the fact that King David in Psalm 22 perfectly prophesies the events that take place at the crucifixion of Jesus 500 years before Jesus would be born, hundreds of years before a crucifixion had even been invented, and hundreds of years before anyone even knew what a Roman was. See, over and over again, we see that the writers, the messengers of God, predict things that are completely unknowable by people in their normal minds. So the only way to explain that, that all of these prophecies, these intricate detailed prophecies, find their fulfillment, is that the eternal God of the universe was speaking into them the very prophecies that he knew would be fulfilled from before time began. And so prophecy is one of the big reasons that we can say with absolute certainty that scripture is reliable. As Peter says, we have the prophetic message as something completely reliable and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place. So prophecy is one. The other one I would say that gives us certainty of the reliability of the message of the Bible is the message of the Bible itself. Pretty much every other, not even pretty much, every other world religion that you can come across basically says the same thing. Here's a prescribed list of the do's and don'ts that you need to carry out so that you can earn the acceptance of the higher power that you're looking to serve. Basically, every single religion in the world has the same basic tenet of this sort of obligatory performance-based earning of acceptance. Every world religion is like that, except for one. Only Christianity doesn't say, this is what you have to do to make yourself right with God. Only Christianity says, this is what God did to make you right with him. Only Christianity says that. Out of all the religions in the world, Christianity is the only one that focuses on what God did, not on what you do. Now think about this. If you were a teacher and you got a tip from somebody in your class that everybody except for one of your students copied off the same test. When you started grading those papers and you found that pretty much every single test had the same basic answers other than just maybe a couple of variations to try and throw you off, but there was one test that the answers went in a completely opposite direction of all the others, wouldn't it be pretty obvious which ones were the tests that were copied off the others and which one was the original, made out of original thought? So the fact that Christianity, out of all the religions in the world, is the one that stands out as a completely different message than the rest points to the fact that that's a message not from human beings, but from God. And so the message of Scripture itself shows us the reliability of that message. And we see that unique message of Christianity on full display at the transfiguration. The holy, glorious Son of God is sent into this world so that he can 
willingly humble himself so that he can take on suffering and death and the punishments of hell so that he can bring people to God. What God does to make you right with him. The punishment that we will see him carry out on another mountain on the other side of the season of Lent. Again, to bring people to God. And so the message of Christianity is the truth because A, God is the author of the message and B, God is the savior of the message. And again, the implications of that for your life and for your eternity are huge because you are on trial too. Not a mock trial, but a very real trial with very real eternal consequences hanging in the balance. And all of the evidence that was piled up against you, getting higher and higher with each passing day, made it a slam dunk that this was going to be a guilty verdict in the end. And then an eyewitness comes on the stand. An eyewitness who saw with his own eyes God in all of his glory, but also saw God setting aside his glory and humility. An eyewitness who saw the Son of God suffer and die to pay for the sins of the world and then also saw the Son of God rise again from the dead on the third day. And because of that eyewitness testimony, backed up by the very words of God themselves, that means that you can have complete certainty that you are not guilty, acquitted, set free for eternity. And that beautiful light comes streaming into the darkness of our sin and our hearts. And we can receive it with absolute certainty because there's eyewitnesses. Eyewitnesses of the truth of Jesus as the Savior of the world backed up by the words of God himself. And so that means that that still today you and I get to be eyewitnesses of his glory. We get to be eyewitnesses of his glory every time that he comes to us in his powerful, heart-changing word. We get to see the glory of God on display every time a person is baptized with word and water and God the Father speaks from heaven, this is my son, this is my daughter. We get to, to look upon the glory of God as he comes to us in his true body and blood along with bread and wine when we receive this sacrament. You and I get to be eyewitnesses of the glory of God every time that we're here. And that sustains us, that leads us to look ahead with absolute certainty to the day when we'll get to see Jesus, all of his glory on display for us, not just a temporary glimpse, but for eternity. And it helps us look ahead to the day when, when Jesus' glory that he showed at the transfiguration is just a, a precursor of the perfect glory that you and I will have radiating out from us when God gives us a perfect and glorified body. So friends, each and every day until eternity is a day of transfiguration certainty. Not just certainty about the transfiguration but certainty because of the transfiguration. Amen.